there's a lot of interest and discussion around the how the COVID-19 virus is transmitted. A lot more attention these days to airborne aerosol transmission. So I'm going to talk to Dr. Kristen Coleman of the University of Maryland about a recent paper she wrote about that. Welcome to the interview, Kristen. Hi, thanks. Great to be here. Well, thank you for being here. And uh, why don't we start with a brief overview of your paper, please? Sure. So this is a study that we conducted in Singapore. I'm now in Maryland, but at the time I was at the Duke NUS Medical School in Singapore. And what we did is we wanted to measure the viral load in respiratory aerosols emitted by COVID-19 patients during three respiratory activities. So first, a 30-minute breathing, uh, 30 minute talk, 15 minute talking, excuse me, and 15 minutes of singing. And so what we did is we have this machine, uh, which was invented by Don Milton at the University of Maryland. It's called the Gazoontite Tune Machine. And on the end of it is a large metal cone that you, the participant will stick their face in and they perform the activities. So for the talking session, we would just have the participants repeat um, excerpts from a childhood book. So we would, say, uh, we would read green eggs and ham and then they would repeat back to us the, the verse. And we do that for 15 minutes. And then the singing uh, part, they would sing um, other childhood songs. So that was, uh, that was the study design. And uh, then we would take the samples back to the laboratory and we would screen them for SARS-CoV-2 RNA. Uh, we would do that through quantitative PCR uh, which is a common technique used to measure the viral load within a patient sample. So that technique is used for common uh, nasal pharyngeal swabs. So the, the regular type of cl clinical sample that you, you receive, uh, we use that same uh, molecular laboratory technique to study our aerosol samples. Right, what were some of the uh, conclusions that you came to? So surprisingly, uh, so one cool thing that the Gazoon Type 2 can do is it can size fractionate the aerosols. So it can size fractionate the aerosols in larger aerosols, which are known as coarse aerosols. Those are greater than five micrometers and smaller aerosols known as fine aerosols. And those are less than five micrometers in diameter. Um, the reason why we size fractionate is because we're really interested in those respirable aerosols, those tiny aerosols that are inhaled deep into the lung. And one significant thing that we found from the study is that 85% of the viral load detected in the entire study was in the fine aerosols. Now, I, I, I'm curious, are the fine aerosols uh, more likely to uh, be part of a viral load that then uh, makes the patient sick? So both sizes, the coarse and the fine aerosols are likely contributing to infections. Um, but the difference is that the fine aerosols, they can linger in the air for longer. So that leads to the, the long range airborne transmission that people are worried about. Um, and that likely is contributing to super spreading events. So uh, for instance, uh, an example I, I've used uh, in other interviews, if I'm sitting in a restaurant uh, and it doesn't, the, the building doesn't have very good uh, HVAC system and it's not circulating the air. So those fine aerosols that are emitted by the people around me and the people at my table, they linger in the air and the fine aerosols are more likely to linger longer. That's correct. And just to point out, there's a common misconception that you know, the fine aerosols only contribute to the long range aerosol transmission, but they also contribute at short range. So if you think about it, if a person is talking, they're emitting fine aerosols along with coarse aerosols, the concentration is going to be closer nearer the infector. So that's why physical distancing is still important. But that's not to say that these fine aerosols do not contribute to long range airborne transmission, which we have observed during this pandemic. Now, the thing I found most surprising about your study is that uh, the 94% uh, of, uh, of the viruses were emitted by talking and singing, and seven participants emitted more virus from talking than singing. So we don't have to go to a church or a concert uh, where I, I would say common sense would dictate that singing would produce more aerosols, but 
in fact, that my example of sitting around a, you know, a restaurant table with uh, having a, sharing a meal might actually uh, it, uh, expose you to, to more aerosols. It could, yes, that's correct. So it all together in the study, more air, uh, more virus was emitted through singing altogether. But like you said, there were seven participants that emitted more virus from talking than singing. And that could have been due to voice amplitude, which we did not measure in the study. So how loud a person is talking can um, really have a big impact on the number of aerosols that are produced. And um, it can be equivalent to just normal singing. So yeah, you're absolutely correct. You could have the same level of risk in a restaurant if you're surrounded by a lot of loud talkers. Now, Kristen, um, you know, this is your field and, and uh, you uh, no doubt are familiar with the, the literature. And there's been a big debate in some jurisdictions in Canada about what the literature says about aerosols. In your opinion, is the, uh, can we say with some certainty that the scientific literature says that aerosols are at least a pathway to infection? Oh, absolutely. I would say um, that by now, the, the evidence is pointing towards that aerosols are, I, I dare I say, the dominant mode. Um, you know, there, we understand now that, you know, cleaning surfaces is still very important, um, but that's usually more so important for gastrointestinal viruses and, and other pathogens, uh, foodborne illnesses. Uh, but when it comes to COVID-19, I think aerosols, you know, that are, are the, the, the big factor here. So it's not droplet. I mean, we know that we know droplets play a role. And, uh, is, and that, can we now say, say that? Do we still, do we, can we still say that droplets actually play a role in uh, transmissibility? Um, you know, we can't say that they don't because <laughs> there's, uh, you know, absence of evidence doesn't mean that, you know, that, that it doesn't exist. Uh, but there, to this day, if I'm not mistaken, there's still no studies demonstrating um, the transmission through droplets. So droplets in my definition, in our conversation now, meaning the, the larger droplets that land onto surfaces and then are later picked up by touching the surfaces. Um, those, I, I, there's still no evidence of that occurring for this pandemic. Right, so droplets landing on on surfaces, but then within, if you're within six feet, let's say we were three feet away from each other, uh, I could still then, uh, you know, you would admit droplets, and I could breathe those, those droplets in, and and become infected. So, depending on your definition of droplets, so um, aerosols are anything that can be inhaled. That's usually the definition that's used. Droplets are too large to be inhaled, um, and they really only make an impact. Um, if you're not touching it on a surface, if you're uncomfortably close to somebody. So if you're very, very close to somebody having a, a very you know, intense conversation, then droplets can, can you know, really probably play a role. Uh, but you know, it hasn't really, we haven't really been able to, to measure the importance of droplets. And I don't, I think by now, uh, based off of the, our uh, biological studies, clinical studies, and also epi studies, you know, all of them are supporting aerosol transmission, so inhalation exposure. And just to, to wrap this conversation up, Kristen, then based on the other interviews I've done with, with various scientists, then now we need to worry about things like ventilation, putting HEPA air filters in, in rooms like classrooms, for instance, school classrooms, that sort of thing. That then becomes a much more important form of mitigation and protection than we had previously, than our public health officials had previously thought. Is that fair to say? Yes, absolutely. Um, that, that's, of course, uh, all of the, the aerosol studies that we've done so far during this pandemic, we've learned a lot, um, support the cause for using those types of mitigation measures to reduce the amount of aerosols altogether in an environment, because we know now that there are viruses in those aerosols before that, you know, that was a question that the clinical um, and, and medical field wanted to answer before moving forward with these mitigation measures. Now we have that answer. Viruses do exist in those aerosols. They exist in even the fine aerosols, the really small ones. And um, we really need to be mitigating them as much as we can to reduce infections. Excellent. Uh, Kristen, thank you very much. Really appreciate your insights.
Thanks very much.